Welcome and thanks for joining us. My first guest today is the Honorable Michael Chertoff, the former Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and an Adobe Public Sector Advisor. Secretary Chertoff, welcome to the program. Good to be on. So let me start off with a little context for our discussion today. You know, I think it was back in 2005, maybe 2006, when someone made the stunningly eloquent comment that it's all that's it's all about the data. The future is all about the data. Here we are, ten years la- ten years later, and agencies continue to struggle to secure their data. There have been memos, there have been policies calling for encryption of data at rest, a data in motion, the use of two-factor authentication to keep data that resides on those networks and in those applications more secure. But as we've seen time and again with the long list of breaches, whether it's the Office of Personnel Management in the public sector or Target in the private sector, hackers are going after unsecured data and exploiting known vulnerabilities. So what can agencies do better to secure their data? Well, there are some basic steps that they can do and some more advanced steps that they can do to really make it tougher for hackers to steal data. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Once again, my guest is the Honorable Michael Chertoff, the former Secretary of the Homeland Security Department and an Adobe Public Sector Advisor. So, Secretary Sheriff, let's start at the beginning. What is the current environment around cybersecurity? What are those biggest threat vectors from where you sit? Well, the traditional threat vector is criminality. It's people stealing credit card data or personal information or uh, trying to download money and get money out of bank accounts. What's different from the old days is the scale of this has become enormous. And, in fact, there was a recent story about an account that the Bank of Bangladesh maintained at the Federal Reserve where $80 million plus was stolen. And in fact, they were on their way to stealing closer to a billion dollars before they made a mistake and got caught. So we've had a huge scale of criminality, but we've also had industrial scale espionage. We've had acts of um, uh, ideological revenge against people who are targeted because of their political viewpoints. And I think most concerning is the possibility of an attack on critical infrastructure. We saw an attack in Saudi Arabia on their energy company back in 2012. Uh, And last Christmas, the Ukraine lost some of its power because a couple of its substations were actually knocked offline by cyber attacks. All of those pieces and parts that are happening is, is all the threat vectors. But it seems recently in the last, let's say, 18 months, maybe two years, it's gone back to the data. People, yes, there's still money is always the, the biggest uh, uh, issue people are trying to go for. But do you feel like do you get a sense between OPM and some of the other the credit card data? It, people are looking to put together the, the data is what's valuable. Well, I mean, the credit card data, of course, is ultimately about getting money. The OPM hack is a little bit different because there what was taken were the personnel files of millions of people, including probably many people in the listening area here. And yourself. <clears throat> and myself, <laughs> who, who had applied for or gotten government jobs. And the theory there has been that it was more about building an intelligence base or platform that could be used to identify people who might be uh, intelligence agents or to target them for intelligence recruitment or something of that sort. And so I think the concern among government employees is – that this might actually be part of a nation state effort in order to target them and accumulate a database of information about people who work for the U.S. In many ways, do you feel like that's a new threat vector or has that always been a threat vector? Because you mentioned industrial espionage. That's very similar, not not one in the same, but it's all in, the, in that same vein. Well, you know, people in, from time immemorial have been engaged in espionage and they've tried to get information about uh, people working for their adversary. What's different now is because of modern data analytics, the ability to take huge volumes of data at enormous scale and then to be able to analyze them and make use of that data is something that's brand new. In the old days, even if someone could have stolen 25 million files, and they never could have devoted the time and energy to actually analyze them. Now you can feed that data into a computer and within a very short period of time, you'll be able to detect patterns or you'll be able to isolate people of particular interest, and that means the usefulness of that volume has become much greater. Is that what's driving, in many ways, a lot of the initiatives we're seeing over the last, again, 18 months or so, whether you were talking about the, the cyber sprint from last summer or the Cybersecurity National Action Plan or even the Cybersecurity Act of, of 2015, where they really focus on information sharing? Well, you know, we've been talking about this issue of cybersecurity for years. When I was in office <clears throat> back in 2007, 2008, we put together the comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative. So this is not a new problem. And in fact, has been publicly discussed. Uh, Cyber attackers could do real damage to the United States, both the critical infrastructure and our financial position. 
I think what changed in the last couple of years, to be honest, is the embarrassment factor. You know, we read stories about um, high-profile penetrations into the White House, into agencies, uh, into political campaigns. And the OPM hack was, a, just again, in terms of scale, something much greater than we had seen previously. And I think that really created an impetus to light a fire under the agencies to make sure they get themselves to where they need to be. It's interesting you talk about the embarrassment factor, because on the other hand, it feels like whenever we hear about another attack has happened, it's like, oh, again, it's almost lost from from a, a strictly news perspective. Yeah. We in the news business are kind of like, oh, it's it's another you know dog bites man story. It used to be man bites dog. Now it's dog bites man. Is that because we've gotten so used to it and it's that expectation that it's going to happen? I mean, there is a quality of a little bit like the old adage by boiling a frog. If you do it slowly, the frog doesn't realize it's getting cooked. But I think something like OPM got everybody's attention because it touched so many people who work in the federal government, and it alarmed them. Because when you do your background check, uh, you're putting very personal information out there, and the idea that someone can rummage through that is obviously going to cause a lot of concern. But I think beyond that, um, the government has talked for a long time about cybersecurity. In the case of the OPM hack, it does not look like it was a very sophisticated attack, it looks like a lot of the IT structure that OPM had was simply outdated. It wasn't being supported. It wasn't being updated. So it wasn't like they were overtaken by some mastermind. It was basically rookie mistakes that hadn't been corrected, and I think that got people's attention. And I think that's what we've seen over the last year, specifically with the cyber sprint. I mean, as you probably well know, uh, the Homeland Security Department, your old uh, stomping grounds, became very aggressive, putting out a yeah. bonding operational directive, telling people to to close up their critical vulnerabilities in 30 days or tell us why you can't. And there's a lot of these policies that have really come from that. Yeah. Do you see that where? 